the hell? Whatever's in there has been safely hidden for 2,000 years. This isn't a tomb. It's a prison. Nick! The hieroglyph said she was named Amunet. Chosen to be Egypt's next queen. But her thirst for power led her down a darker path. One that had to be stopped. Because of your actions, this ancient power has returned. Welcome everyone to Cinemarcade. We are the podcast that talks about movies, video games, and the sparks that fly when those two worlds collide. And boy, oh boy, are they flying this week because we're talking about a scintillating, uh, amazing blockbuster that all of us have extremely fond memories and thoughts about. Uh, No, I'm kidding. We're talking about The Mummy from 2017. That's the Tom Cruise one, not the Brendan Fraser one. And we're also talking about the video game adaptation, which many of you may not have known existed. It's called The Mummy Demastered. We're going to be getting into both of those. But firstly, I am the undead corpse of Steve Guntley. I'm very happy to be here. Who's joining me today? Uh, hi, I'm Justin Wilhelm, and I learned that there was a mummy movie and game that came out in 2017 this week. Uh, you would learn new things every day. Uh, I'm the desiccated mummy of j <laughs> I was really sorry to hear that you got desiccated. I mean, I, it always... All mummies should be desiccated. They That's should the whole be. point. They should be. No, you're right. You're right. It was just a little too soon for you, I thought, you know. Um, but yeah, we're... we're uh, let, let's call this the counter-programming to last week's episode. We watched... Uh, last week, of course, was E.T., uh, which we watched a very great classic <laughs> movie and played a famously terrible video game, and... So bad. This is kind of the only time I'm going to be putting my thumb on the scales a little bit just because I wanted to demonstrate the concept of the show a little bit. So I wanted to do the polar opposites. I wanted to do something that's a, a, a very bad movie with a surprisingly solid game. Playing through it, we'll get into it. I'm not sure if this uh, is quite the inverse uh, uh, level of the E.T. video game. I'm not sure. I think it would need to be the best game ever made to be kind of uh, in that category. I'm not sure if this one quite qualifies, but, you know, we'll 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 discuss that a little bit. Yeah, but it definitely doesn't beat Barbie Playland Adventure. <laughs> Nothing so. beats Barbie Playland Adventure. I really hope the Margot Robbie movie addresses the continuity in that. Um, <laughs> I also forgot there's a Barbie movie coming out. It's the it, movie I'm most excited about this year. Not it's even kidding. to be spectacular. I'm looking forward to it so much. I just um, want to hear the theme song. Oh, yeah. The Barbie Girl song. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can only imagine it's going to be somebody like notable covering it. Right? Yeah, it's like Post Malone's version of <laughs> I Love the Barbie Girl or something. I don't know. I I'm don't like, know who's cool now. I think Bruno Mars could take it, slow it down, add some funk to it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, who's popular? Michael Buble. Yeah, he's a popular is, guy. Is yes. Michael Buble popular? Or was I that have like no idea. I'm a, years ago? I'm a million years old, Look, so we, I don't know. I don't, I don't keep track of any of it, so I don't know yeah. who's... Who's hot? Billie Eilish. Sure, yeah, she's she's a she's a big person. I think is that yeah. that that's the perfect choice for. Uh, I, f- I felt Barbie very Girl. cool and hip that I bought an LP of uh, Wet Leg of their of their debut album. I'm However, like, All right, so that's that's the new cool thing. So I'm I'm on top of it. I'm good. But you bought an LP. That is the that's the counterpoint. I did, buy, <laughs> I did buy an LP, but only because it wasn't available on wax cylinder. Uh, I would have. <laughs> I would have preferred that if I could have uh, the gone. The coolest for that. things that have ever been said in 2023. <laughs> that's that's where the hipster tide is turning. I'm sure we're going to go back to wax cylinders or like shouting through a megaphone, like "Hello, my baby, hello, my honey." Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do that any minute now. Uh, all right, so neither. Well, okay, so Justin, you were not aware that this mummy movie existed. Yes, and okay. also 
a controversial statement. I didn't watch the first one either. So okay, this was I, my first full you, mummy. Wait, movie. wait, 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 one, wait. Or? Do you mean the, yeah? Do you mean the 1930s or do you mean the okay, 1999 sorry. The, one? The remake that happened at the beginning of my lifetime. There you go. So the 30s. Um, yeah. 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 Because yeah. 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 okay. again, we're you, undead reincarnation. Okay. <laughs> You're not, we're gonna have to have a movie night because I mean, let's uh, do it. You've got to at least do that it's, first one. It's formative, it like is. I've been told. Formative, and I've, I feel like I've seen a scene or two on TV at some point, but I definitely know that I haven't seen the whole movie. And there, there will be a time, like down the line, where we're going to cover those mummy movies. There, are, there are oh. games based on all three of those, so we'll we'll run the trilogy. But this one is not a part of that continuity, and no. it's not a part of the original continuity either. It's its own thing, uh, and we we will we will get into exactly the kind of thing that it is. Um, but yeah, that that uh, just to say that ninety nine mummy movie, I've heard pretty much all of my bisexual friends have cited that as like the moment that they realize <laughs> that they're bisexual. Uh, that is accurate. Yes, yeah, because it's it's kind of a it's a it's a it's a, a, a feast or famine kind of situation. I mean, you've got you've got uh, Oded Fair and you've got Brendan Fraser at his youngest and hottest. You've got Rachel Weisz. I mean, come on. Yeah, so it's it's that's a pretty formative movie for a lot of people as well. I recognized one of those names. Oh, okay, all right. We'll we'll get you caught up. Okay. Uh, we we will introduce you to the splendor that is Rachel Weisz. Yeah, yeah. Rachel okay. Weisz is a stunning actress. Like, yes, uh, she's such a good actress. She was in this um, uh, lesbian uh, Jewish romance that is like a spectacular movie. I can't remember the is name. This, of oh, I know the one. You're. It's like dif- it's not defiant. It's, it's defiant. like it's I disobedience. Think it is, yeah, it's disobedience. It's disobedience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's so so good. Yeah. Uh, it's her and Rachel McAdams. Yeah, yeah, she's got s- such great acting chops. Uh, she's just so. She's, she's married to Daniel Craig. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. So they, they, they good taste all around in that in that marriage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dang. Less good taste, I would say, is the ill-fated 2017 Mummy movie that we are talking about. <laughs> Today, I mean, we actually have to talk about it. I'm afraid we have to talk about at least some of it, as much of it as we can keep into our minds. Um, yeah, th- this movie is a pretty noteworthy uh, disaster. I mean, the fact that there was like a 200 million dollar mummy movie that Justin, as somebody who pays attention to movies, you hadn't heard of it. Uh, they spent that much money on this movie. I guess they spent so much. Thinking money it on this through, thing. there's a lot of VFX. A lot of probably. VFX. Uh, Tom Cruise still draws like a big salary, you know, and then pretty much any time if you see like a marketing or like a, a, a production budget listed for a movie, you have to double that again for marketing if it's like a major summer studio movie like this. So take a hundred and twenty five million dollar budget. So now it's like, you know, two fifty uh, at least. And this movie did not make that much money. So. Pretty, pretty noteworthy failure. Uh, Jabin, were you familiar with this movie before uh, this so, episode came up? I am a historian. Uh, I studied archaeology. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a lover of the 1999 bisexual awakening movie, The Mummy. <laughs> I knew this was coming out, and the advertisements for it were so bad, so devastating that me, a person who watches maybe four to six movies in cinema a month at least yeah. mm-hmm. at, i mean on a slow month yeah i did not go see it i did not see it in theaters either um i think i only came around to it because it was the subject of a lot of bad movie podcasts i listen to and uh, i like to watch along with movies like that when i can and i am an aficionado of bad movies but this one is the worst kind of bad movie to me where it's it's not bad in an interesting way. It's not bad in like a, a unintentionally funny way. It's just bad in a very committed to death, like corporatized, bland summer offering kind of way. Like there's no joy to be had in this movie whatsoever. Like there's just no moments of like levity. There's no moments of lightness. There's no moments of astonishment or or anything like that it's just kind of a long slog of nothing i did find moments of levity uh but i don't know if they're they were meant to be funny right uh but um i thought it was really interesting how they kept they were wavering wildly over the tones like you've got the original uh 1930s the mummy which is a stunning movie and i heartily recommend it to anyone who yeah. uh, 
watches it. Um, the the weird thing about old Universal movies, like the monsters, they don't like maul you or claw you like Wolfman and the Mummy all strang- strangle they're, they're you. They're Everybody stranglers. Everybody strangles except Everyone for Dracula. Stranglers. He still goes for the neck though. They all go for the neck. It's all this like dramatic like do 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 going for the neck. Uh, but there's like there are moments when this movie wants to be a horror movie. There are moments when this movie wants to be a light action heart like light hearted action adventure movie. Yeah. Uh, there are other movies when it's trying very badly to be like uh, comedic. Um, <laughs> I mean, I I guess maybe having Jake Johnson in here as as your sort of comic relief is like the one little bone they throw at you. But I mean, he's not in the movie much. Like they kill him pretty quickly, and then they're doing like an American Werewolf in London. That's kind of exactly. Thing. They were ripping off American Werewolf in London, and they didn't even do it properly. Yeah, like they could have showed him decaying as the show went on. It's just like if you're gonna rip someone off, rip someone off. Yeah. This is a case where, like, I don't think anything in the movie itself is particularly interesting, but I think everything surrounding this movie is very bizarre and and kind of unintentionally hilarious. So I, firstly, I guess the the big elephant in the room we have to talk about here is Tom Cruise. Now, what what are your guys' takes on Tom Cruise? Out of curiosity, I enjoy Tom Cruise in many of the things that he's in. But I don't think I would ever want to talk to him as a person. <laughs> that is pretty much exactly <laughs> right. It's like uh, I don't – I'm not in – if I saw him at a thing and it was like I had an opportunity to be like, hey, I would probably just be like, eh, yeah. I have a 100% confidence I'm, that enough. he would be sweet as pie to talk to. I think he'd be – I think he'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I think he'd be a really sweet person. I think, um, you know – I think other things besides the point, uh, but I think he'd probably be very sweet to a fan. Um, I, Which is, yeah, that's backed up by yeah. history. Like everybody who's met him says he's pretty nice. Yeah. You know? I, I feel like for me, Tom Cruise is such a behemoth of filmmaking. Like, and he's just gone from strength to strength to, dropping the ball to strength to strength to dropping the ball i mean most recently maverick incredible i mean a number one movie of the of last year and like kind of a movie that is is uncontroversial in like pretty much everybody loves this movie like whether you think you're gonna like this movie or not whether you like the first top gun or not you're probably gonna like maverick like and that's kind of a hard thing to pull off well and i think it's interesting because like he's trying to be a charming ne'er-do-well uh, literally like when we open on the movie our protagonists are in are antiquities thieves like they are not here like and he's a sergeant i'm sorry a sergeant with that much it's, autonomy yeah like, it, it's such a weird thing because throughout the entire movie he just changes between stereotypical action hero and and vaguely roguish but then the the vaguely roguish part will be for like a solid single minute yeah and then back to stereotypical action hero of like oh no he acts like he doesn't have a heart but he does yeah yeah i mean I, look i i think tom cruise is an incredible movie star. I think he's one of the best movie stars that we've ever had, like kind of divorced from the concept of being an actor. I think he is just, and, and I think yeah. more than any other performer working today, you have to look at every one of his films, not as like a film or like as a work or anything like that, but as one more piece in this monolithic career that is Tom Cruise's career. And that's why the mummy is interesting to me because this is probably his lowest ebb. Yeah. Looks great. For what fifty six? He, he's like sixty now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's doing a topless. Oh my god! I never even thought about how old he is. Ah uh, man. Uh, so the, uh, when I went to go see Maverick, uh, I was I was visiting my hometown in Colorado over the summer, and uh, I went to go see it. And I don't know if you guys had this at your screenings. Like he he had like a video introduction where like it's just him looking at the camera, like thanking people for coming out to theaters, and uh, he you know he he looked a little puffier he looked a little older you know which of course he is and it's his right and he should look older at his age but i had some guy in the seat next to me yell out you're old and i'm just like 
Wow. Okay. All right. That's uh, that's quite a stance oh to take God. against a, uh, a man that's probably younger than I, you, I think sir. He's also in the unique position of he has all of the connections he needs, all of the money he needs, and all of that to be probably the closest thing to immortal, right? Like, right. He's if anybody's going to figure it out, all the things, uh, whether it's you know dietary or injections, whatever it is, yeah, he's getting everything exactly right like you'd have to imagine a person in his situation like yeah doing everything he can to to keep and it's not necessarily keep young but like to keep in that shape i imagine so he, he just has doing all of the things i bet he just has the most efficient bowel movements of any human being on the planet <laughs> oh, i bet it sounds like exactly. a t-shirt cannon coming out it's just like <laughs> it's so it's such a there's like no resistance anymore he's just trained his body you know like he's one of those guys yeah he he's he's an incredible presence he's also a lot i feel like he he would be uh, kind of like, yeah, I think he'd be nice to a fan, but he would probably be sort of insufferable to spend any time with because he is so extreme in every single thing he does. And that's why it's interesting to look at this movie kind of as a, a, a subset of his career. So let's kind of look at where he is at this time. He's, you know, he's pretty well ensconced in the Mission Impossible series. Those are always popular. He's always going to insane lengths trying to kill himself making those movies, this which is like right around I when, appreciate. They, when they start bringing Simon Pegg in. It's yeah, like a main yeah. character. Right, yeah. He became uh, like a recurring character after three, I believe. Yeah, and this is like and four or five times. Yeah. Yeah. And but he you know, his his star had kind of been waxing and waning a little bit. He'd had a couple of misses. He had movies like Night and Day and and uh, Oblivion and things I like that. He really like, likes Night and Day. Oh you know, Night and Day is kind of a fun <laughs> movie, but it's also like it didn't really connect. You no, know? it didn't connect, but it was a really fun adventure rom com. It is, yeah, absolutely. And there's you know, I, I don't think he makes very many outright bad movies like i think he was just fresh off of edge of tomorrow when this one came out and that movie slaps it is oh, so yeah. good I love edge of tomorrow, tomorrow may be one of my favorite just like action movies it's yeah. so good it's uh, so so good i but love it the concept yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. the weird part and i i remember reading a thing about that and it was that he, he didn't want the title to be edge of tomorrow the original Ugh. title got pushed to the subtitle. It was supposed to be Live, Die, Repeat. Well, but and they it's, thought that would be hard to market. It's based on a manga called uh, All You Need Is Kill, okay. which is also a bad title. Yeah. And then Live, Die, Repeat is also a bad title. So they kind of had three different bad titles for this movie, and people got confused by it. But, you know, he's kind of at a lower ebb at this point. And so what's the most popular thing in movies in 2017? Well, that is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a massive undertaking of all these interconnected films. And so Tom Cruise, being Tom Cruise, figures he should have his own MCU. He should have his own kind of little franchise like this. And then we get the Dark Universe. I'm so, like, 100% uh, uh, just tickled by the idea of the Dark Universe. Uh, I bought this shirt. I'm wearing a Dark Universe shirt right now. Just the moment I was, uh, it was clear that this thing was going to fail because I'm a hipster douchebag. But, so, a little bit of background on the Dark Universe. This movie was going to be the beginning of, like, a M avengers style interconnected universe that was going to bring back all of the old Universal monsters. So your Invisible Man, your Wolfman, your Frankenstein, all of those characters were going to come back, and they were all going to interact with each other and have different adventures and uh, work together like that. And they... Uh, you know, so they, they kind of had a false start. They did this movie in 2014 called Dracula Untold, which they were waffling a little bit on about like, okay, is this part of the dark universe? Is this not? Like it was kind of a bomb. Nobody really saw it. And then I think ultimately they decided, no, let's scrap that. We're going to start the dark universe right here. Tom Cruise is going to be our, our Robert Downey Jr. And he's going to spearhead this whole project here. There was... A now kind of infamous photo shoot, which you can only call a photo shoot uh, in air quotes because it was all photoshopped together. None of these people were in the same room. But they were announcing the stars of what would be the Dark Universe franchise, which was expected to go on for a decade, maybe more. We have Tom Cruise anchoring the mummy along with Sofia Boutella, who was supposed to come back for later entries. You, of course, have Russell Crowe as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You have Javier Bardem as Frankenstein's monster. You have Angelina Jolie as the bride of Frankenstein. And you have Johnny Depp as the Invisible Man. Now, all of these are 
I would argue, except for maybe Javier Bardem, these are all kind of movie stars sort of past their moment, you know? They're they're all in their 50s and they're all, you know, kind of kind of not really at the heights that they were like back in the 90s. This isn't going to be a thing that's going to last for 15 years before recasting someone. Not necessarily. I mean, never say never. I mean, uh, Harrison Ford just did an uh, Indiana Jones movie this year at age 80 something, but Yeah. But, you know, like either way, it it felt pretty desperate like right off the bat it felt kind of desperate it felt kind of sad you know and there there was this kind of nice organic synthesis of the mcu you know and the fact that they don't need to rely on like mega huge stars for every movie you know they could kind of mint their own and this one just felt like a pretty obvious grab so then the mummy comes out and Tom Cruise movies have made less money in the past, but I don't think any Tom Cruise movie has lost as much money as this. Um, this was a very, very expensive film. I think it only made $80 million in the U.S. box office, which still sounds kind of decent until you consider it made. Pro- it cost probably close to $300 million, you know, so it, it was kind of a ridiculous flop. And they were still planning on going ahead with this Dark Universe idea. They still had uh, the Bride of Frankenstein movie was going to be the next one up. But it was pretty clear from the response to this movie that that was just never going to happen, that nobody was actually interested in seeing this thing. I think it's so interesting that people love vampires. Mm -hmm. People love mummies. People love Frankenstein. It's been redone, what, 10, 12 times? So many times, yeah. Like, it's not the concept. It's not the... These are classics for a reason. They are meant to be on screen. It's just that they didn't want to honor the original source material at all. And by not honoring the source material, they get this ha, Frankenstein's monster of, of nonsense. Yeah. And it's just like if they had honored, even if they honored the, the spirit of the 1999 version, um, like and just made it an action adventure with scary moments, I think they would have done really well. And I think... It, to be honest, uh, I, I think you could have saved this movie with some severe editing and um, some rewrites. Yes. Like, I think you could have made this a middle of the road adventure uh, instead of the. <sighs> What's a nice way to say mess? Um, Dumpster fire trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Michigan. Mistake. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's so, um, it's so haphazard. And like, Okay, so get this. We're gonna we're gonna have an ancient Egyptian mummy movie, and we're gonna start in Iraq. Who does that? Yeah, like you start in Egypt. Like you you start where? Did you not have the money or funding to shoot in Egypt? Go to Egypt. Was this even shot in Iraq at all? Did they not just go out to Nevada somewhere and be like, "Hey, here we are"? It's probably all Vancouver. Everything's Vancouver. It's the vast <laughs> deserts of Vancouver. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and yeah, you could see they're they're. I imagine there was a better movie in some stage of development than this. Um, by all accounts, so this movie is directed by Alex Kurtzman. I think it's basically his directorial debut. He had one little indie movie before this, but this is his big screen directorial debut. He was better known as a screenwriter before this. He did the Transformers movie. He did uh, uh, a lot of stuff for J.J. Abrams and things like that. So He like, started Fringe, which is a TV show that I really quite adore I love fringe yeah. r.i.p lance reddick by the way yeah oh God. um but yeah and uh uh you know so he was a kind of also and he's now the guy who's in charge of star trek like all the new star trek shows on paramount plus are all alex kurtzman uh and by all accounts alex kurtzman was basically pushed out of this movie because tom cruise sort of took the reins on this uh he's always been a guy who's very protective over his image and his brand and everything like that so he brought in christopher mcquarrie who's like his guy his like screenwriter guy did all the mission impossible movies and he brought him in to uh do a rewrite on this and the new rewrite apparently built up cruise's role a little bit and downplayed sophia batella's role and she plays the mummy she's you're downplaying the role of the mummy in a movie called the mummy uh and i think it leaves us in kind of an ambiguous place because kind of jumping ahead to the end here like I think this movie is kind of implying that Tom Cruise is going to be the new mummy. Yeah, that, like, that was heavily implied, which I'm just like, 
what are you doing? Like they, you're not a mummy. You don't have no like. What's the famously next a guy? Movie? Famously a guy with a good face that you don't want to cover up with bandages the whole time. Like you know, I don't know what the play there was. Not to harken back too much to the 1930s version of the mummy. The, that mummy is a romance story. Yes, the romantic situation between the mummy and the female protagonist is fucking excuse my language palpable no, I swear. um and it's just like they're they could have created a genuine tragic romance but they seem to split his attention between this and of course a jenny um and it's just like what are you like if you you could have done that dracula did an excellent split um love triangle but you you drop the ball and having this woman be completely uh, she's beautiful but she's completely unappealing she's she's a baby murderer they they give her nothing to do yeah they give her nothing to this is one of many movies that has kind of not used annabelle wallace very well um you know and i you know i i will give credit to the casting of sophia batella i think is really smart i think she makes a very like compelling looking villain and she's she's got a very unique screen presence but yeah she's kind of sidelined for most of it like you're not really clear what the threat is you know this being a tom cruise joint of course we need to get like a big uh, uh action set piece so of course there's the the plane crash sequence which uh, probably the best scene in the movie mm-hmm. i think you know yeah. the most effective one but they Looks also kind of they also kind of blew their wad with this because this was what the trailer was the trailer was just this scene and there was a hilarious error like i i saw it in a theater um I forget what it was before, but there was an era where some of the uh, trailers went out without any sound effects or music. So it's just dead silent except for Tom Cruise like grunting and screaming as he gets thrown around the plane. And it's unintentionally like hysterical. Like, look it up if you get a chance to see that without the audio. It's really funny. But that went out into theaters, which like kind of hurt this film's um, uh, image a little bit, too. But. You know, yeah, but that that's probably the most successful scene in the movie. But then it's immediately pivoting to like, OK, is Tom Cruise immortal or is he, you know, like the, yeah. this is where we start getting bogged down in a, just a deeply uninteresting mythology. They they do this thing where they don't focus enough on anything. They don't focus enough on the romances. They don't focus enough on what's actually happening and saying what is his current situation? Is yeah. he can he be killed? What's going on? I love how his curse is immortality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like you need to like look like you're rotting or anything. You still get to look like Tom Cruise just forever. You know, good for you. Yeah. And it, it's like it. it's so weird. Again, it just felt like a, a movie that was kind of lost. Uh, but again, it felt about as romantic. I've never felt a Tom Cruise movie to be particularly romantic. They almost that's all always have. been true. I, yeah, I, he does a really good job, I think, of casting like really strong actresses mm-hmm. to play mm-hmm. against. But you never feel that heat. You never really feel like yeah. there's a heat between him and his female like, co-star. Even even all the way back, I've only seen the original Top Gun, and I only saw it after Maverick came out. Mm-hmm. Um, but even that was still like. Is this actually romantic or is this just written by a man? Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, that is absolutely what it all feels like and what it feels like here, too, of where it's like there's very clearly a romance subplot, but it never hits. Yeah. Like you never you're never rooting for any of them. No. Well, and I think they they do that wrong right from the introduction of her uh, like making a joke about him lasting 15 seconds because like is she into him yeah like she should be simping a little bit over him if she's into him or she should be upset but she shouldn't like i don't know like instead of just being i I don't know it's just (laughs) such a weird beginning of like if you want a will they won't they true love story that's a weird way to begin it can i draw a parallel to this yeah it felt like at the beginning of the iron man series where iron man where robert dunny jr uh tony stark is like that playboy kind of person yeah but it felt just like his interactions with one of the people that is never seen again in the movie and no longer important that's that's a great way to put it and so that's why it was so weird to me when she was the co-star of the movie because i was like okay they never that whole they never really properly resolved that beginning part yeah other than like trying to focus on a joke that then went further than it needed to be. 
and then you're just like, okay, it doesn't feel one. They've Tom Cruise's character Nick uh, has now shown himself to be not a good like lover, romance partner, whatever. And but he's also not like a charming rogue either. He just exactly. kind of seems like a dickish There's nothing. There's no charm. He's yeah. trying for Han Solo. Right. And he's failing. He's missing it by, by a wide and margin. And he's missing it for a couple of different reasons. Like, because Tom Cruise has the, ca- like, has the charm ability, uh, but it's, so, the dialogue is so bad. Yeah. Um, and the, um, the lack of focus. Like, uh, when, ha- when Harrison Ford looks at a woman, he fucking looks at a woman. Sure. Uh, when, Tom Cruise looks at a woman. He's just like, I'm beautiful. I, he's this, catching his reflection in her eyes. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember who who said this, but uh, it was somebody prominent in like an interview or a comedy special or something. Barack Obama. I don't know. Yeah. But they, they were basically like, if you really pay attention, like Tom Cruise does so much right when he acts. Facial expressions, all that stuff. But there's just always something with the eyes that is a little like almost uncanny valley and when it comes to anything romantic like you were saying that's kind of the important part is the eyes and the way that they look at somebody and tom cruise looks at everybody like they're a person like they're a generic per he looks at every single person the same way that's it's always kind of been his like secret sauce is that he does not feel emotion fully human (laughs) <laughs> well, he, he just doesn't he, – he always feels like he's trying to uh, uh, be an, a kind of such an elevated human with the things that he can accomplish and all the – like just just kind of the pure force of will he puts behind everything, which makes him like incredibly fascinating to watch. And this is maybe the only Tom Cruise movie I've ever seen where I was bored by him, where like I didn't feel any kind of spark coming from him. And a lot of it is because this movie is just so weighted down with – you know, uh, it's the kind of thing that the worst MCU movies do, where it's like, all right, we're setting up the next phase, all right? So we've got to introduce this person, this person, this person. The whole part with Jacqueline Hyde could have been cut. And it would it, have made it, it a It feels like movie. it's from a totally I, different film. It feels like it's dropped in. So, yeah, Russell Crowe pops up in here, and he's like the Nick Fury of this movie. He's the he's the head of a secret organization. What, uh, Prodigium? Is that what they call it? I think <laughs> According so. okay. to the video game. According to the game, it's <laughs> called remember. Prodigium, uh, where, which is basically a secret society that's, like, monitoring all of the world's monsters. Uh, ridiculous on its face. And this could be a fun idea. Like, Tell me that you've got like a monster Avengers out there. I'm like, okay, yeah, all right, all right you there's you've got me of, on the hook. There's tons of movies that have, or TV shows that have done similar. Like they're just like, oh look, uh, Warehouse Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> um, like they they're things where that they they do the monitoring, but they're usually in television, not film. Right. It to me, all of the Doctor Jekyll and Mister Heist, like that whole all of the Prodigium stuff. It made it reminded me of the Hellboy movies. Okay, um, yeah. Except again, without the charm. Like I won't say the Hellboy movies were great movies, but they were at no, least No, but it's Guillermo del Toro. Shut your mouth. It's Guillermo del Toro. Shut your mouth. Shut it. Del Toro has a real appreciation Justin. of like this mythology. Yeah. This does not feel like anybody loves <laughs> that they're having to do this legwork. Exactly. You know? Okay. Like it doesn't have the charm. I like I said, I did enjoy Let me all let the me movies. let me register my op- opposing opinion that I think the Hellboy movies are spectacular. I think um, Hellboy 2: The Golden Army is a stone cold masterpiece. Uh there's so charming they're uh, i love them okay i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm gonna shut up i'm gonna shut up about the I, Hellboy movies. I just always You're entitled assumed to your that opinion. everybody didn't like them uh i enjoyed them when oh, i, 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 saw I them. love the Hellboy movies. Um, yeah i haven't seen them in a while but it, it really felt like if <laughs> it felt like they were trying to knock off hellboy the mcu every tom cruise movie ever at the same time while also having zero consistency in literally anything the romance wasn't consistent Tom Cruise's character wasn't consistent. The randomly appearing and disappearing uh, apparition that he's imagining in the background wasn't consistent. Yeah. Um, Russell Crowe's character didn't even seem very consistent. Half of the time it seemed like he was the Nick Fury character, and the other half of the time it felt like he was the bad guy. And I'm like, 
And I was what waiting for some kind of cool, like, Jekyll and Hyde reveal. And it's like, oh, he's wearing different contacts and has a different accent. Yeah, like, and he doesn't. And, again, the original, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, beautifully written. Oh, the Spencer Tracy one or the uh, Frederick March? I'm or? talking about the book. Oh, the book. Okay. The book. Yeah, yeah I don't read. Um, <laughs> I don't even know Spectacular, how uh, tense, uh, taught with internal like you know am i a monster like am is, is that what i am like complex you know, character it, it's yeah. a complex not world. an exposition delivery machine yeah. yeah and it's just like <sighs> i like russell crowe i i love master and commander oh yeah uh the oceans are not battlefields i don't know if you heard this <laughs> they are um like i think master and commander is one of like the most underrated movies of all time um that like, movie's been getting a weird like resurgence online lately. Have you been seeing that? Like, it. I don't know why. It's like thirty or twenty years later, people are finally queuing into the fact that this movie rules. I'm like, like yeah, I've known this. Yeah, Master and Commander is such a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you just like it feels like he's it's inelegant exposition very um, very clunky very and clunky, it, and I just didn't care. Like, I just also like on its face like. Tom Cruise has never been a team player. Robert Downey Jr. can be a team player in in the Avengers movie because he was kind of that was the movie that was making him like the massive yeah. movie star. Like he wasn't coming into it with all this massive movie star baggage. He was kind of coming into it with like, all right, this is my last chance of redemption. Tom Cruise does not have that narrative. And he's also not really a guy who shares the limelight very comfortably. You know, he's done a few supporting roles over the years, but like they're in either tiny little comedies like, uh, oh, look, Tropic Thunder's not a tiny comedy, but it's like a small little cameo role like that for a joke. Oh, my God, I forgot he was in that. Or very small things like Lions for Lambs and stuff like that. But, yeah, but, I, you know, so the, the the concept of, like, building this universe around an idea where Tom Cruise might occasionally be a player, like where he might jump in and offer some advice every once in a while, doesn't feel like something that's in his wheelhouse. I think... We're also not talking about something that did everything in this movie better, mm. and that is Moon Knight. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, yeah. I really liked the Moon Knight show. That like that. Well, first of all, it was embracing kind of a similar mythology, but it also it was willing to go weird in a way that this movie is not willing to go. Like this movie is so boilerplate. It could be it could be any one of a million like dispensable it, blockbuster movies. It just felt like again there was no focus. Like like you were saying, the exposition from Russell Crowe's character half the time the whole conversation happened and you got one detail. Yeah. And like I just spent 3 minutes watching this interaction and we learned almost nothing. We established almost nothing. That scene could have been 500 different other scenes yeah. and it would have been fine. And that Something was the involving problem. character mm -hmm. development, maybe. If, yeah. if they gave him a character, if they actually developed him at all. But he was just literally like almost a cameo character mm -hmm. as far as depth went. Okay. A challenge. What did you actually enjoy about the movie? Uh, you know, like I, I will say the, the plane crash sequence I thought was well executed. Uh, I liked the visual effect of uh, uh, the mummy having four pupils. Like it didn't really make sense, but I thought it looked cool. And I think Sophia Batella's vibe in general was just is I mean, she's she's got a she's got a lot of like natural charisma. I think she makes for a good villain. I wish they didn't sideline her so much. I also like Jake Johnson a lot. And again, I think. If you if you'd used him a little bit more, maybe had him as be a consistent on screen sidekick instead of killing him off in the first fifteen minutes and then making him a recurring ghost buddy, like you've got something there. Like they've, I think, Cruz and Johnson had like some some mojo. They had some energy, yeah. like when they were interacting with each other, and then they take that away so early. Um, I thought it was a pretty good looking movie. I thought a lot of the effects looked pretty good. A lot of the like scene designs when they have like the big chamber where they're holding uh what's her name the mummy um okay. i thought i thought everything there was a lot of interesting visual things where whenever you looked at something you weren't bored of looking at it you were just bored of listening to it or watching everything else there's so much gray in this movie though like i i yeah, it just looked like the whole – I mean, yeah, it's a lot and, of it is the mercury, you know, but – And that's where I feel like, again, it was so weirdly inconsistent because you'd have a very drab gray scene 
then you'd go into a scene with a lot of colors and it was like there wasn't a consistent vision for so many different things yeah but i i I thought the camera work was oftentimes fun and interesting. They tried some stuff here and there. I mean, you throw this much um, money at a movie, then it's, you know, it's gonna, it should at least look like it's made by professionals. And it yeah. does, you know, and I but think it kind of harkens back to a little bit again of like the Hellboy and like the earlier movies around that time period where they were like, yeah, let's just, let's try this weird tracking shot from behind this thing. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I felt like that was fun. But again, so many of the scenes were boring and uninspiring. And then occasionally it would just be like, we're going to be in a tunnel for the next 20 minutes. And yeah. we're going to use three colors, blue, white, and black. Yeah. And you can only see one at a time. <laughs> yeah. That's all you get. Um, I really enjoyed the four minutes where they decided to be a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. And I really oh, with the, enjoyed with, Like draining the bodies and everything like that. It was yeah. just like, it was so enjoyable with the, the dead bodies coming back to life, the zombies. Yeah. And it was just such an enjoyable four minutes. Uh, and I was just like, ooh. And then it was, and then they just, um, they, it was interesting. They gave her so many powers, but then her powers are inconsistent. Yeah. So she has the ability to make zombies out of spiders bites. What is that? Can you not do that? But no. then she does oh. it. Oh, weird. Like, that's it. They, uh, yeah, I think you're right. She just didn't feel. She felt like she was all powerful, and then she wasn't powerful at all, depending on what scene you were in. Well, when they needed to keep her imprisoned, and I'm just like, is she a monster, or is she not a monster? Yeah, it felt like they were kind of teasing the line of like, okay, maybe she's like this misunderstood asset, or 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 at least like maybe <laughs> the, like a like a Loki whole, type. You know, they had that whole segment where he's all like, yeah, but you killed your father. He's like, yeah, but I loved my father. Yeah, but you killed a baby. It's like. It was a different time. What? <laughs> what was that? Again, it was the 80s. Say. They, they put yeah. so – they did such a bad job of making Tom Cruise's character and the mummy likable characters. And it – Or or like she didn't, not, she didn't feel like a threat ultimately. Yeah. The, the thing to me is you can – when you want a character – like I think what they were going for is they wanted them to be kind of complicated characters that – um, you like part of them, you don't like the other part of them. Yeah. But then they just made both characters. The mummy again just killed a kid and her dad, and was like, okay, yeah. all right. Um, and then Nick is again kind of an insufferable jerk. Yeah. Most of the time when he's interacting with people. Well, and another thing that drove me crazy as a woman, this woman's job. She wanted to be Pharaoh. She killed her father, her stepmother. And her little brother in order to be Pharaoh. But somehow she wanted to kill a man who would be over her to be her leader mm. and her boss. What the fuck? Yeah. Like what? You can have what, all what's... the power in the world. Okay. I want to make somebody to tell me what to do. Well, okay. I, I, I want I want to transition to the game in a minute here. But uh, one minor quiz. Okay. This is the oh, second... Lowest ranked Tom Cruise movie according to Rotten Tomatoes. It has a fifteen percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So he has one movie that is ranked lower. Can either of you guess what that movie is? I'm gonna guess a movie that I don't believe is actually this. I believe this movie is like probably up around eighty or ninety percent. Okay. Uh, but his accent is so bad. Um, <laughs> so there's this movie called Far and Away, where him and Nicole what's wrong Kidd with his accent in that one? <laughs> so I'm saying he got a fifteen percent just for his accent. It is not Far and Away, but uh, I I agree that's lower tier for me. I don't know, Justin. Do you have a guess? I don't think I'm familiar enough with Tom Cruise's movies. So I would have to say my least favorite Mission Impossible was like Mission Impossible Two. Okay. The one with the Limp Biscuit song. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was it was not that one. That one ranked way higher. The lowest ranking movie in his Rotten Tomatoes is nine percent. It's the movie Cocktail from nineteen eighty eight. That's actually Cocktail. a good movie. I mean, again, I don't know. Yeah, I, know. I watched it when I was six. Probably in an in is, inappropriate movie for a six-year-old. Yeah, of course, I have, I have a memory. It is. It is a movie very much about like, like gross consumerism of the '80s. Like it's it hasn't aged super well, but it, you know he he does little cool tricks with a cocktail shaker, which he does not do in the Mummy that even is once. Literally, the only thing I can remember from Cocktail is I just remember being a very small child watching it, like uh, probably playing 
with Legos at the same time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with him like flipping bottles and like I, I think I wonder how many bartenders got into bartending just because they're like wow. I have I have personally witnessed many people dropping expensive bottles of booze trying to pull off some of the things he pulls off. Uh, I used to work at a TGI Fridays when I lived in Scotland and uh, in, in Aberdeen, uh, and they were spectacular. But they the tricks were is that you could never use a full bottle; you had to use a half a bottle to get mm. the right rotation. Yeah, and they were pretty spectacular at like tossing those things around and catching them. And I'm just like. <sighs> And uh, I, they would, um, I would always sell Sambuca shots because they would set them on fire. Oh, yeah. It was my yeah. favorite thing to upsell people. Meanwhile, Did anybody, can... like, uh, try and drink it while it's on fire? And like, oh, my beard is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dunk me in the lock real quick, like. Yeah, that's what they would say. <laughs> that's, that's exactly exact, what they would say. That's exactly how they would say it. It's like you've brought me back in time. <laughs> yeah, welcome back. To, welcome back to Scotland. All right, so we've covered the cinema part of this podcast. Let's talk about the arcade path of this podcast. We were talking about a game called The Mummy Demastered. Now, a uh, few people really registered that this mummy movie existed, so even fewer uh, noticed when this game came out. It kind of was a direct-to-download game, so I don't think there's a physical release of this anywhere. Um, but this game is made by WayForward, uh, which is a company I always really stump for. I think they have a real skill for spinning gold out of garbage. Uh, I think they, they, they do a lot of licensed games and because they have this commitment to doing these kind of eighties or eighties and nineties style pixel art, it always elevates it just a little bit. Like they always find a way, like if any company was able to make a good game out of Sabrina, the teenage witch from the, the, the Melissa Joan Hart version, it's these guys. They made two pretty solid game boy color games based on Sabrina, the teenage witch. So that's kind of what we're working with here. They also did like Contra 4 and like a bunch of other great games. Do you, um, do you ever wish that video games had box office receipts? I really do. Like they have like MPS scores, but like there's not really a consistent like box office mojo style place where you can chart all that. I'm weirdly obsessed with box office figures. So, yeah. Or did you mean like so you can keep the ticket stub? Oh yes. <laughs> no, I went because I'm I'm always super curious about like how people made their money back for games and okay. yeah, um, whether or not they did because like you have some games which are like gigantically successful, but like what does that actually mean? Does that mean that they're more successful than the the corresponding movie? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I think it's I think it's safe to say that this game sold less than the movie because yeah, I, I think this has pretty low. Um, mm -hmm name recognition and i think by the time this game came out the movie was already sort of box office poison and nobody wanted to really do any have anything to do with it uh well one one thing to mention right off the bat tom cruise does not appear in this game nor does he appear in any video game we're actually going to cover a couple of games based on movies of his and he for whatever reason he has never granted his likeness to do a movie or to do a video game and in fact the minority report game which came out in 2002 it follows the plot of the movie, but they just changed the main character to be like a blonde guy, just specifically to make him look as little like Tom Cruise as possible. So I don't know what that is. I imagine it's just brand control. It's just him having a really tight grasp over his image and like what goes out. But by all accounts, he is a gamer. Like he plays games. He plays Destiny and stuff. So I don't know. Go figure. Either of way. He plays Destiny. Of course. Of course. Um so the mummy demastered kind of finds a novel workaround to not having iconic character Nick Morton in the mix here, where uh, you are now playing just kind of a generic nameless soldier working for Prodigium, which is, of course, the the monster hunting organization. We get kind of like a loose facsimile of Russell Crowe's face in this, like giving you mission assignments. Um, he pops up from time to time to like give you advice, but... Kind of the cool thing about this game is that, like, because your soldier is so generic and nameless, like, when you die, you just become one of the mummy's horde of zombies. And if you want to get your gear back, when you start again as a new soldier, you need to go kill the last one. Um, so, Boy, which which leads to leads to some uh, 
I, I think some entertaining <laughs> challenges for us as gamers, like trying to play through this part. We'll we'll get into that a little bit. But this game is a Metroidvania. So for those not familiar with the phrase combination of Metroid and Castlevania, it is sort of like an open world uh, build out your map. You look for different objects that will help you access a new area of the map and you kind of work your way through it like that. This kind of game is basically just like catnip for me. Um, Super Metroid is my favorite game ever, so pretty much any time a Metroidvania game comes out, I at least check it out. I don't love all of them, but I always try and check them out. Um, and so that's kind of what we're working with with this one. But much smaller scale, much more modest scale than everything they're trying to do. Like, there's no real mention. Like, I don't think at any point you're going to encounter an invisible man or a wolf man or anything like that. Like, so you're you're pretty divorced from the story of this game or of the movie, I would say. And I think that's to its benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially like the 2d side scrollery aesthetic, uh, also helps. Cause then they, they don't have to deal with a lot of, they can just, whatever we want, we can have here. We yeah. don't have to explain anything. Um, the beginning of the game, you're like trying to find the lost team and you're just like walking over dead bodies nonchalantly like nothing's yeah. going on. And you're like, -da 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 -da. oh, you found the, the communications thing. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah. I don't even think they reference the fact that the original squad is just dead. Yeah. Uh, you you just see them all dead on the ground. It's It's unclear where in the continuity of the movie this takes place. I think it's kind of like between the cracks of what we're seeing on screen. Like, I think, I think when the game starts, correct me if I'm wrong, like, wasn't this like the aftermath of when the mummy first came to life? Like when they found her in it? Cause they find her in Iraq, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you, they switch to the plane crash. But I want to say off the bat, the second you go to the start screen of this game, you realize it's better because the music is better. The so music, good. like yeah. going from John Williams to the generic scoring of the movie, yeah, was so was so jarring. Yeah, um, and then to go to this awesome, fantastic score, vaporwave esque situation that the video game had was it was just so enjoyable. It's it's got like mood and atmosphere to it, like you know, it 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 just immediately kind of grabs you. I think this game looks fantastic. Um, you know, it's all like this. I, I love when modern games use like old school pixel art because mm -hmm. now the technology keeps up where you can have fluid motion and you can have very seamless yeah. controls. Uh, you know, a lot of those old games are a little stiff just kind of because they were working with the strictures that they had. Well, and because a lot of old games are working with actual pixels, whereas here it's like, okay, this game's in like 720, 1080p. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The pixels are a choice. So the, the pixel isn't a real pixel. It can move wherever it wants to move. It doesn't exactly. have to conform to specific pixels on the screen. So then, yeah, like you're saying, you get solid, pretty solid animations. You can keep track of all the parts of the body when you go into a roll. Totally. And stuff like that. Um, the stills for the cutscene were so well done. I just really enjoyed them. Yeah, I mean, and they don't they don't go overboard. This is clearly a game that's made on somewhat of a budget, you know, and they don't go overboard with it. Um, you know, I I played this a little bit more than you guys did. I, I put about three hours in, so you know, I I made it a decent way through. I don't think it's a super terribly long game. I feel like I'm getting pretty close to the end. Um, what were your guys' impressions of it from the early going? Better or worse than E.T.? <laughs> um, definitely better than E.T. Just because oh, see, of the I'm fact going worse. That, yeah. yeah that there's actually people who... There's actually text that comes up on the screen and says things. And it's usually how things work uh, at minimum. And so... Also, you can look at things on the screen and determine what they are based on the shape of them. <laughs> yes. Which the, is very nice. It's very refreshing. Very novel. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not a big fan of... Really, most 2D side scrollers, but uh, as far as it goes, I mean, it played pretty fluently. Um, I say fluent, it, it, fluidly. Yeah. Um, there wasn't any weird jankiness. Uh, the only difficulty was getting used to how to roll because you have to come to a complete stop, then crouch, then roll. You can't crouch while moving and roll, um, which is what I kept trying to do because that's often how it works in other games. Yeah. But the shooting, everything just worked. Yeah. And there was never something where you were annoyed at outside of like, oh, I hate this enemy. Yeah. 
there there's a steep challenge level to this game and i think we were running into kind of the biggest failing of this setup like we we jumped ahead to play like my we started a new game and then we jumped ahead to play my save file so we can you guys could see like some of the weapons and items you get later on the game i forgot i had saved it at a point where i had just died so we needed to go retrieve all the gear from one of the zombie corpses that i left behind now, when we say you just died you yeah. just died three different times twice in the same place that's where we're running into the problem <laughs> here okay because here's the thing your your guy your starter guy he is a babe in the woods. He is very exposed and every little thing hurts him really bad. As we discovered, like it was pretty common to run into a common enemy who would take half of your health with a single hit. Uh, the mummy swipe. The infamous mummy swipe. The, the mummy would come out of the ground and attack immediately and then do like 55 damage. And yeah. you only have 99 health. Yeah. And so the problem is like your the former corpse still has all of your gear. He has all of your guns, all of your grenades, all of your like super abilities. In order to get those, you need to go back and kill him and retrieve it from him. But the problem is every time you die, another zombie comes up because you are not one person. You are several different people. So you can amass a small army of these very well-armed, kind of difficult to defeat zombie corpses and sometimes you need to run through a whole gauntlet of other enemies to try and get to these well, guys. So you could kind of like end up sort of screwing yourself here. One of them will be severe, like heavily armed, and the other ones will be kind of dipshits. However, it's not easy to tell which one is which until they start throwing grenades at you. So you just have to kind of take them all out. And like I had the misfortune of dying at an awkward point underwater where there are already like several other enemies, including these piranhas that sort of don't really obey the, the the laws of the screen you know they can go off screen off screen and, and like they take a lot more to kill than you might expect for every, like a minor fish enemy everything in that area took a significant amount of time to kill with the default weapon which is all we had mm -hmm. and then we finally get it done and then i think you were playing at the time yeah and then you start using the stuff that you had had before and you're just like one or two shouting these things that you're were taking us it, yeah. 30 seconds yeah. to fight before. It's so much more satisfying to use this little harpoon gun than you get <laughs> later on. And just like, oh, yeah, fuck you, fish. You're dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I That is one thing. Uh, there's a couple of the enemies that were a little bit – they were very annoying because, like, for instance, the, the mummy could come up and be attacking in like a split second. It was yeah. hard to react. And so maybe that – I mean, I don't know how else you make a game difficult. That was kind of annoying because there were times where there's almost no way to avoid being attacked. Yeah. But then uh, there was no recourse for dying really late in the game in a really shitty area. Yeah. And then now you have to go fight this superpowered badass with the starter gun that barely can kill anything in the area. The chaotic part of me loves this game. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the I love the concept of this mummy... Uh, you 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 being a dead body that's raising from the dead that you have to kill that you're just like this um babe in the woods going out after this mummy af after mummy after mummy that because you die in the same spot however functionally as a game it's really frustrating yeah <laughs> um really frustrating and, and uh, we also, during this, learned that you were in the middle of playing Elden Ring. Yes. And uh, that really painted the picture of why you like games like this so much. <laughs> because I hate myself, uh, <laughs> and I want to punish myself. Exactly, yeah. No, I mean, it, th this game is pretty hard. It is a nice respite from Elden Ring, which is much more punishing than this. But, yeah, I, I am picking some weird... Uh, companion pieces to go together because this this is pretty tough for a metroidvania game like i said i've played a lot of these i'm usually pretty good at these um and i've made it a decent way through but there were some boss fights through here that took me like you know six seven eight attempts you know like some of these are pretty difficult now i have a question if you die during a boss fight do you have to fight the boss and you uh you the the zombie version of you comes back in a room just before the boss okay. so you don't need to fight them both in the same room you have a chance to reclaim it's your like, stuff here's the crappy assault rifle uh go fight the boss and now a guy with grenades c4 and a harpoon gun <laughs> yes yeah that would be uh very unfair luckily they they countered for that like they they moved the guy just to like a, a safer space so you could take him out and get your stuff and back but you do still have to get your stuff back that was something that also happened to us because we died underwater and oh yeah brought us 
the version of us came back above the water um, in like the next zone over to be safe because we didn't have the ability to allow us to stay underwater for long periods of time. So for for so, a while, like our experience with this game was garbage can shooter simulator. Uh, we were you know, you were spamming like different garbage cans like to get your health built up because you have to run through a gauntlet of crows and scarabs that are going to deplete your health before you have to face off against the zombie yous. So like yeah, scarabs aren't that big. But everything and else scarabs? about this game is a documentary. I don't know. This Maybe is something they... that I had a problem with the original Mummy, the 1990 Mummy. Scarabs are just beetles. They're not bad creatures. They're super adorable. No, They're like they absolutely just, cute. They just happen to feast on human flesh, and it's they, not their they problem. Don't, they don't feast on human <laughs> flesh. Listen, that is a I myth. I saw the documentary from 1999. They burrow under the skin and make you run into a wall. No, they eat dung. They literally take well, feces this is, okay, and this turn is a family it into podcast, soil. podcast, okay? This is a gross, a family gross. Podcast. Yeah, no. It's a motherfucking family podcast, motherfucker. <laughs> no. Watch your fucking mouth. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, kind of generic Castlevania baddies of just big bugs, big dogs, big birds, you know, things like that. But, you know, like I, I still, I got into the spirit of this. And as... A companion piece to the movie, I feel like it kind of weirdly corrected a lot of the issues with the movie, which mm -hmm. is we are not suffering through exposition dumps. The stories that we get are through little text boxes that are very brief and don't interfere with the experience overall. And we're not having to deal with some kind of chosen one mentality because our main character is literally disposable. It's literally a nameless guy going into the meat grinder over and over again, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think... I'm very I'm just very tired of these like chosen one destiny narratives which they're they were kind of trying to turn the movie into like I don't give a shit like just have it be a person on an adventure think, doing a thing. I think they explicitly during the movie at least once or twice called him the chosen one. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, Tom and, Cruise has that in his rider. He has to be addressed as that uh, <laughs> everywhere he goes. Yeah. And literally it's just because the mummy thought he was hot without a shirt on. Yeah. And then suddenly he's the chosen one when there were tons of other really attractive dead men sure. that she could have chosen. <laughs> really yeah, attractive she had her, dead she, men. She had her pick of the core of the of the whole morgue. <laughs> of the whole morgue. Did, so now, literally nothing but beef here, you know. Let, remind me, did she choose him when he was in the temple or when afterwards? Oh, God, who remembers? Because yeah. I feel like that's why he survived to be in the morgue was because he'd already been chosen because he touched something. See this yeah. some shit. Uh, my, it's this because he showed up, he showed up in front of the um, the uh, sarcophagus, and instead of his BFF who had a silly sense of humor, yeah, uh, he, uh, he suddenly he's the one who's having these the f flashbacks made no sense. They were headache yeah. inducing. They were the flashbacks were so poorly done in my opinion yeah. um and uh anyway so she he she had flashbacks to macking on her which is i think a new genre of scene where it's like hot woman in the desert only dune does it much better yeah um, yeah <laughs> also like i'm gonna throw this out there to to any listeners that we may accrue at some point like i feel like Take the average woman on the street, and they are going to go for Jake Johnson over Tom Cruise. Yeah, like 100%. I feel like that's going to be the first. They're for you know, Nick from New Girl versus the guy with like so many muscles who keeps jumping off of shit. Like I feel like they would go for the the schlubby Nick it's, from New Girl, especially if they knew about the background of the people. They'd be like, oh, you know. That one has some baggage. He's got maybe some issues. He might maybe be, may or may stuff. not be involved in a quote unquote church. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not going to go That's... into it because I don't have the resources to fend off a lawsuit. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's such an interesting movie. Yeah. Um, there are so many times where I'm like, okay, I like this scene. Um, and then we go to a scene where I'm like, why are we here? It just it's a movie that as a film, it kept like sabotaging any kind of goodwill that you accrue towards it, which is something that I feel like the game at the very least avoids. Like the game did not make me more interested in the movie or the world that they were building out, but I had a better time 
playing around in this world than I did in, in the two hours of the movie. Yeah, and again, I feel like it's it's a premise that should work if you execute it reasonably well. Look, the, like, the, the Universal Monsters were the original connected universe. Like, mm -hmm. uh, on paper, the Dark Universe makes sense. Like, yeah. But, uh, like like J-Ban said, uh, so, so much was... Just, like, so many marks were close but not close enough to actually like land anywhere yeah um that constantly you were just like the the when they first revealed that he was dr jekyll i was like oh okay and then i know that uh, guy yeah it's like i i i vaguely I am guys. aware of these the, this situation here but then just so many things were never properly given care and attention yeah like the flashbacks mm -hmm. i was like oh this is gonna mean something and then no. no. Well, I mean, kind of, but we already knew what it meant, which was just that she wanted him. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm, this will be my last comparison to the MCU, but, uh, like, obviously, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was planned. Like, they knew it was going to happen, but they, they sort of tested the waters with Iron Man. They made Iron Man a standalone movie that you could watch and enjoy without all the baggage of like the entire cinematic universe and this multi-billion dollar franchise on its shoulders. So it got to be funny. It got to be irreverent. It got to experiment and take some risks. And I think this movie is just coming in trying to imitate what the MCU was and not how the MCU started. Like there's no organic development here. It's just very, yeah. it's very clearly like, all right, let's get this out of the way so that we could start cranking these movies out and making that money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was almost like a thing, uh, like how Black Widow was, where there were so many situations where like, knowing what it was supposed to be, you're like, oh, okay. This was just here to introduce that character. Sure. And they, they focused on using the movie to try to build a world, but they didn't make a good movie which is, if I remember correctly, the exact same problem that DC had trying to launch the DC universe. Yeah. Which was they just tried to launch the universe instead of trying to have a good movie with, like, one or two things that we could tie back to. Like, if Dr. Jekyll, if that was it, and we actually, he was a useful, like, we gave him a little bit, he was important. I mean, yeah. Not even important, but, like, we gave him proper side character treatment and wrote him well. That's all we probably needed, and then we could have the Doctor Jekyll origin story, or we could or, have done or, so many different things. Or even if you, yeah, even if you just went full Nick Fury and did the post credit yeah. stinger, yeah. yeah. Or they could have just kept it a mystery. They could have built suspense. I think it's so interesting about like uh, a story. An exposition is not a story. No, and story is not exposition. But there are stories with fantastic exposition. I mentioned Dune earlier. Sure, the new Dune fantastic example of how to do exposition in world building um because it creates a world that you want to sort of exist in and sort of bask in and i don't i did not get that sense well of this because movie. it invites you but it doesn't shove it in your face right um you know you have to is issue an invitation uh to join this this incredibly complex backstory um instead of just laying it out there and laying it out there in a way that doesn't make sense that doesn't that isn't a plus b equals c like they could it's have done so many well like they open on the knights templar by the way i used to work for a templar historian um <laughs> where you would uh, uh, to, for for listeners uh, uh j-ban is actually an albino monk <laughs> <laughs> um, so just be prepared for that. She's, she, she might stop occasionally to flagellate herself. Um, and like there's tons of people who love conspiracy theories about the Templar Knights. And you can build that. I mean, the Da Vinci Code built an empire yeah. on that mystery. And somehow it's Guess just Guess what? A That's footnotes. a game we're going to be playing. <laughs> there's a Da Vinci Code <laughs> game. We're going to play that. I, I think you said something that now that the gears are turning, it really yeah. hits, which is they, the whole, like, I think Dr. Jekyll, if they had just only had Dr. Jekyll, and instead of having him immediately do, like, the injection to keep himself from transforming, if we just had Dr. Jekyll and we didn't know anything about Mr. Hyde yet. Yeah, tease out Mr. Hyde. We could have been like, okay, so I'm assuming this is him, right? Because, like, this is the thing. But we don't know anything about him. If we properly Nick Furyed it, which is not explaining Nick Fury other than the fact that he shows up 
and clearly is in charge of these things. Right. If if he just gave the quick like, I am in charge of this thing. We hunt down creatures and try to keep track of them. Yeah. And then never again referenced him having another side to him. And Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is not the Incredible Hulk. No, no. And this is, again, like, this is the same thing that the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen did, where they just tried to turn Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde into the Hulk. Like, I think it's just the easiest analog, but it's not the same thing. Either way, the Dark Universe, a big old hairy miss. Um, the, the the Mummy Demastered, you know, kind of solid. Kind of solid all Really around. weird thing to call a game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it is a it's weird, a weird thing shot to call, to call a there. name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, bad naming all around. Um, yeah, bad naming all around. Um, all right, so I think we have uh, uh, kind of come to the end here. We've got to get to our rating section. So are you guys considering this a good movie, good game, a good movie, bad game, a bad movie, good game, or a bad movie, bad game? Where are we all in on this? I think for me, I'm, I'm going um, bad movie, good game. I think that's, you know, like I said, I put the thumb on the scales. Like I kind of decided to do this because I felt it was the opposite of the E.T. version where it's a very bad movie with a surprisingly strong game. This is not a masterpiece. This is not a run out and play it right now, but... When you compare it to the quality of the property it's based on, I think it's uh, leaps and bounds better. Bad movie, good game, uh, excellent music, and uh, like just f- it's a fun game. It is. It's, it's fun. Uh, like if you've got four hours to bang it out, like you should definitely like take those four hours, play it, have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the movie, it wasn't, it was a bad movie, but it wasn't like et bad uh in terms of how bad the game was sure um there were moments where you're like oh okay um but a lot of the time you're like eh, okay yeah um in the game again not quite my thing but it, it seemed like a good game it's the person who's into that would probably pretty well enjoy it again played well there was zero moments like et where we just sat there going <laughs> What is this? Where <laughs> like, am I? What am I doing? Like, yeah, we uh, had moments of frustration, but we never, they were never based on just literally yeah, being confused. Like, we knew what we had to do. The, the, it's not a new type of game. They use a lot of the things that you need in that type of game, and they use them pretty well. They have a map. The map gives you waypoints of interesting things and also highlights rooms you've been to that had interesting things like yeah. spawn points and stuff like that. Um, and so I think all in all for what it's, what it came from and what probably went into it, pretty decent game. Well, excellent. All right. Well, we have got the mummy out of the way until we get to play the better mummies or watch the better mummies. Well, we'll watch one good mummy and two bad mummies, I guess. Uh, I don't know where we're going to come down that trilogy, but we'll get to that down the line. But next week we're going to be playing a very interesting combination. We are going to be, uh, watching the movie, Wayne's World. Yes, that's right. There is a video game based on the SNL classic from 1992, Wayne's World. So let's see if that is uh, excellent or if it's uh, totally, I don't know, what's a bad thing they say? Turbular. No, tubular is good. Tubular Tubular is almost better than excellent. Yeah, turgular. It it might be turgular. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. We will see you next time. Party on, dudes. (laughs) 